who are you? I am a full-time forensic artist for the Houston Police Department. And you were previously a police officer? Yes, I've been a police officer for over 20 years. So how did you end up here? It's a long story. I've always been fascinated with art. Um, the previous forensic artist, Lois Gibson, saw some of my artwork and said, you need to be a forensic artist. But she was the uh, considered the number one forensic artist in the United States. There's a very few forensic artists in the United States, full-time forensic artists in the United States. I think, I believe there's only 20, 21 positions like that in the United States. And the Houston Police Department has two of them now. Thurston Johnson is the newest on the scene, speaking just months after going from part to full-time as a forensic artist with the Houston Police Department. Thurston says he primarily works with crime victims to recreate an image of the person who wronged them. To me, that's part of police work. Typically, artists are expressing themselves, but in this case, you're doing something very specific. How does it feel to to be working on something that has such dire consequences for people? Well, to me, I I, I like pressure. And to me, it's not pressure. I feel like I'm helping out uh, a citizen of the city of Houston. Mm -hmm feel like I'm helping them solve their own case, their own crime. While witness memory sketches take up most of his time, Thurston also helps families who believe their missing loved one may still be alive. Uh, usually you age progress uh, a missing person every three to five years to come up with what they might look like. So maybe there's a chance they can be found. How do you do that? Uh, well, there are lines in the face, your ears and nose never stop growing, you know. So when you present a finished age progression to somebody and they see that for the first time, what are those interactions like? Uh, they were very excited. Um, they loved the artwork. They were, they were hopeful. They were hopeful on that. They were grateful that we were able to help. Were you an artist growing up? How did you learn? No, I wasn't an artist growing up. I, I loved art. I found it fascinating. I used to draw all the time. Uh, I have family. My family are full of artists and musicians. So uh, I'm just picking up where they, where they left off. Good evening, my friends and our regulars here on The Missing Live. We have a very special episode this week because we're looking at something uh, that is connected to our ongoing effort to try to find those who are missing throughout Texas and throughout Houston in particular, where we know that thousands of people are reported missing any given day. I was at an event and learned a little bit about the age progressions that are done for people who have been missing for multiple years. We have interviewed and done stories on people who have been missing anywhere from six months to 20 years and counting. And when someone's been missing a long time, but there's reason to believe they might still be alive, it helps to know what they might look like now uh, so that someone knows who they are looking for. If it was a child over the course of five years, a lot can change. So as you just saw this week, we have been speaking with the Houston Police Department's forensic art team. And I am joined today by two of their star artists, two people who I was just, guys, I was just floored meeting you and been had so much fun putting this together. But I want to start by letting you guys have a chance to introduce yourselves to everybody. Hi, I'm Officer Thurston Johnson. I'm Brian Bradley, civilian. All right, so we heard your background, Thurston, just now in part one that I just shared with everyone. There's It's a three-part mm -hmm. series, but um, Brian, give us your background because you fascinated me with just catching me with the, yeah, I was working in a store and the cops used to come in. What, yeah, how, did, um, how did it work? Yeah, just like that, I was working at the store and I've been drawing all my life pretty much since probably four and um, I never really saw forensic art as a career, like, like that, as if that were an option. So I just kind of kind of fell into it because I uh, had law enforcement where I was living com coming to me and saying, hey, can you draw this guy that we're looking for? And I'm like, OK, sure. And through that, I, I ended up meeting Lois. And now I work here. So. Lois was a huge influence on on all of you. That was so very clear. And I think a lot of Houstonians don't realize what a gem we have right here in Houston uh, and that she recently ended for almost four decades yeah. of doing this work. So talk a little bit more about Lois. Um, and, and I know that, you know, she was tied to both of your origins. Yeah. Yeah. She was tied to mine. I would see her all the time because I worked in a different division on the same floor. And, we, and I would talk to her all the time. And uh, 
she just happened to see some of my artwork and was like, wow, I think you can be a forensic artist. And so that's how I ended up uh, meeting Lois. And uh, ever since then, she's sort of been mentoring me for the past eight years, seven going on eight years. And, and she's still mentoring us right now. Still, even even though she's retired, she's still. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's very active. Yeah, yeah. She us. calls us, talks to us and critiques us sometimes to help yeah. us improve our artwork because you always have to constantly be improving as an artist. What an incredible treasure to have here in Houston. So she, I mean, she was prolific, prolific in her work. How, you know, she's identified so many people. She holds a Guinness World Record with her art. So talk a little bit about yourselves in terms of identifying people with your art, because that's primarily what you do, or at least that's what you said, is that most of what your work is doing, working with witnesses to sketch and draw people who have wronged them, right? People from crimes, people from attacks. Um, so, so talk about identifying people and what it's like to have that you know, add a number to the list. Well, uh, usually how, when we interview somebody, it's we have a, a catalog of uh, facial features. It's called the Steinberg catalog. And um, it's got cer certain mug shots in it that feature like foreheads, eyes, kind of stuff like that. So it gives people a visual aid to look at, and, oh, his head look like you know, A112 and eyes look like B6, whatever. And we just, you know, make a list and put all that together going through. So. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the talent, but there's, you weren't, you had no formal art training prior to meeting Lois. So what was the first thing you had to learn how to do? No, it was just Matthew's like, huh. Well, the first thing I, I learned how to do, well, I, I sort of been, doing artwork on my own a little bit, uh, just drawing, learning, because I figured, hey, you know, I, uh, I, I was a, a 40 year old man who's about to be a father, I'm gonna be at home, so I might as well learn how to do some, some sketching and artwork, which I was always interested in doing. So I started just trying to teach myself more about art and learning. So uh, Lois saw one of my pieces, that, my first piece of artwork, with some fine art and somebody saw it and wanted to buy it. And so they, I was bringing it here and I was gonna bring it to them and Lois, that's how Lois saw it. She saw some of my fine artwork and said I was really good. I just thought I was okay, but she sort of confirmed like, hey, I do have great art skills. Yeah. So you can continue to develop. So talk a little bit about how it's done. And you talked about the book, but all of you said that there's sort of an art to getting to that picture, which has largely to do with the interview than sitting down with someone, that you can be the most talented artist in the world, but if you aren't having that moment properly, that you really can't get there. Oh, oh, oh well. Y'all are so nice. That's <laughs> all right. Well, as far as like uh, trying to get there, as far as the interview process, trying to relate to the person and trying to to get them to relax and let them know that you're there to help them. It's basically trying to form a connection with the person so they can go back into it. You, they're, they're going back into a, a, a uh, difficult time in their life. Uh, something tragic happened to them, bad happened to them. And so you're basically reliving it again, but you're trying to assure them that, hey, we're here to help you. Uh, we're going to help you solve this crime. We're going to assist the the investigators in this and this is a way of you contributing to solving your case so it's like trying to connect them on a connect with them on a personal level you know um you know it, it's just it's trying to form that that connection and you spent so 20 years in the police department so you've worked with people you've been on the scene i mean you you, you have enough stories that i imagine that you're able to connect with people in that way yeah yeah i have lots of lots and lots of stories of police work i'm still a police officer I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm going to try to do it as long as I possibly can, especially here, because uh, I feel like I'm almost impacting, helping out a little you know, more. It's more impactful. I know when you're on the streets and you're running calls, it's, you know, you're, you're very busy. So it's hard to develop, to connect. You can talk and interview, but here is more of a connection with somebody to help them investigate their crime. Do you find yourself getting invested in, the outcome of cases and checking in on them and wanting to see what happens, or there's just so many that, that you really don't get the chance. I usually talk to the investigators and try to track what the progress is. That's mainly 
what we do to try to see what the progress is. Yeah, we, we do a follow up on, on our cases um, a lot. Um, and for me, I, I do sometimes get kind of personally, you know, affected by some of them. Um, just, you know, because you're, you're meeting these people that's like, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to them. And, and by drawing and working with them, and because, I mean, when they get in, they have no clue what we're going to do. So, but they've agreed to, you know, sit down with us and describe somebody to us. But, you know, it, it's more about making them feel comfortable and more relaxed and everything. And uh, they, they really kind of get into it sometimes and you know they're, they're you're kind of giving them closure yeah. in a way of, you know. that's got to be a really special thing to be able to give someone yeah 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 especially like he said closure because uh like i said you know when you you, you hit a sketch you know because you'll get a reaction from the uh uh the victim you'll get her you'll know oh, like okay no. oh yeah we got we we got them uh because it's because once we don't show the, them the sketch right off the bat. You know, they're talking to us and we're sketching. We're, you know, and uh, after we've done the interview and we're working on the sketch. And so when they finally come around and, and see that suspect from the other side of the, the easel and you see that reaction, or sometimes it's like, uh, I said before, it's like bittersweet because, yeah, I'm helping you. But yeah, if they're, sometimes they'll start crying or get emotional because, that's the suspect that did something wrong with him. And so if you guys have done your job right, the eyes, everything comes to oh. life in that drawing, which mm -hmm. is something we saw with Lois Gibson. I mean, her ability to bring things to life was incredible. And and as oh, yeah. in the piece, I mean, you can see over here, this this piece here, how she just, she brings the, the, the eyes alive. And you were talking about how, Brian, you said that's the truly yeah. the window to the soul. That's the difference between a, a good piece and, and a great piece in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's she's real big about that. She goes, oh, you, you got to add the the white in there to the to the light. I've actually got a drawing here of eyes that I've done. So yeah, I, you know, making, pull it up. Let us see. I pull it up that. to the camera. Oh, okay. Show us some. I see Spock back there as well. Oh yeah. I imagine yeah. he's not in any legal trouble. You were no, just no, maybe having good. some fun. No, okay, he's, good. He's okay. Wow. Like this is just practices that we we did. So. It was amazing sitting and going through the book with y'all to see just how many different elements to the face there are for someone to piece together. You talked about it like a puzzle. They have to pick the chin and then the jaw and then the nose. And it was just fascinating. And then we had, we sort of joked, but you guys said that sometimes you'll be out somewhere and you're looking at someone's face and you're sort of breaking it down into all of those pieces because you're so used to right. piecing it together. Yeah, yeah. We are used to and, that, out. and that's kind of being an artist. That's kind of how we see the world anyway, is you do, you just, you know, you see the world differently than other people. You do break things down like shapes and you know, geometry or whatever. And that's kind of how you live your life. Yeah. Just the way you see sure. things. So, yeah. so it's like when you said, you know, I make it sound easy. It's, it feels more like a second nature to me because that's how I already see things. That's so, your gift. I mean, what an incredible yeah. gift to be able to share and use. And in terms right. of working full time, y'all mentioned that a lot of you guys get to go out to schools and talk to art students mm -hmm. about the fact that this is a career path in art. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so for, for those who maybe are watching this or know someone who likes to draw, and we all know someone, um, you know, what would you say to them in terms of, or what do you say to students and, and to people who want to get in this direction? Um, just really, uh, you know, it, practice drawing people and, you know, really immerse yourself, hit, hit the, hit the ground and, and pound it into the you know, police departments, you know, minds to, to use, to use your sketch. To yeah. Use yeah. Your, Cause that's what Lois right. did. She, was very aggressive because uh, like a lot of law enforcement weren't using uh, forensic artists. Right? Yeah, it, it, it's a very kind of eclectic Group. sort of, uh, you know, career to do. Yeah, like, yeah. 
that's why it's not so many forensic artists out there right because it's such a, a tight knit tight knit group we're all a member of iai uh international association of identifiers all uh, most most of your forensic artists are members a member of that group and so we'll meet together once a year to go over to teach each other mm -hmm. because it's such a small group so you find yourself getting to know all the other uh, full-time forensic artists or uh, other artists from yeah, there's not from other country, and it's not that many. <laughs> yeah, you said, <laughs> so, you said more, more than two dozen, really? Full-timers? Yeah, 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 it's not that many full-time forensic artists. There's not that many. No, is that due to a lack of... Romania? Uh, I think in, Germany, Germany? in Germany, in Germany, yeah. like, they have 40 full-time artists, forensic artists, but we have more crime in Houston, and we only have two. Yeah. So, so it's it's just a tool that you know is out there and it's available, but it, it, a lot of investigators don't know to utilize it. For yeah, I have a question from Nicole who's watching right now. Um, Nicole wants to know how long it takes to do a sketch with a victim. Mm, it depends at, uh, with the the uh, depends with the um, complainant. Yeah, um, you know of, of them picking up, but for me, usually it takes me about an hour. Yeah, it so, depends. It, yeah. it if it's more than one suspect, it might be two hours. Uh, the longest I've spent because I've had like multiple suspects, maybe two and a half hours. So wow. it depends on how many suspects we're doing. Yeah, and it depends like on the uh, how you get going because I've done three suspects in less than an hour, and I'm yeah. just like wow. I, and a lot of it depends on the interview like, process. A lot of it depends on uh, the interview because it depends on the individual and how, you know, uh, how cooperative, co cooperative or, or it depends on what kind of strenuous situation they've been in because I've had, I've had uh, victims of crime that were very, they weren't reluctant, but it was very traumatic. So it was a very emotional right. interview. And so I've had that and it. The interview might last a little longer. Interesting. Uh, Y'all are getting some real, real credit here in the comments. People saying, way to go, Brian. Talk about seeing y'all in the big time. I mean, you've got to have a lot of people who are really proud because I, I know from experience, my sister's an artist. I've got a lot of artists in my family. Um, it, it's it's very hard because you get to a certain age where you're almost told by a lot of people, hey, time to hang it up, time to move on. Um, and here you guys are among the few people who are full-time artists. Uh, but for, for police, it's such a different thing. And, and it comes with all the police work. Uh, so is this did you ever see this when did you start to realize it was a career path was it when lois ins inspired you guys i mean clearly for me, when was, police yeah. were coming to you yeah 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 for me it was like the police using me and like going yeah, i guess i could do this because I, I don't know and then somebody told me uh got to contact lois and that's kind of just went from there. So. Yeah, and me, I just happened to run into Lois with yeah. some of my artwork, and, and I would talk to her every now and then. But she, when she saw my artwork, she was like, "Oh yeah, you need to do this." And so training with her, she just got me to realize like, "Hey, maybe this can be something I can do as far as a career path." Because I've been in law, I was already already in law enforcement, and I'm like, you know, maybe I can be a forensic artist. Maybe I I, I can help out in that way. Because like I said that's why I joined the police department in the beginning to help people. So this is another way of uh, helping citizens. That's great. And I, I have to apologize to everyone watching and thank those who stuck around because I, I kept the best question for last. Brian, yeah. I want to ask you or give you a chance to talk about reconstructing faces from bones, uh, which I just, I mean, we didn't even get into it in the series because yeah. you were telling me that on the side, <clears throat> but absolutely, you can look at a skull and you can draw the person who that skull belonged to. Mm -hmm. what? That's incredible. Yeah, it's compared to this actually it's not as difficult as you would think because you've got the person right there it's their skull that's their structure it's you know that's the person you just gotta add the layers and i, I think I, I said to you before like only your skull can fit your face so eventually you will come come to that conclusion and actually the first skull i worked on was like half a skull. So I kind of had to you know, actually found somebody here at work going, hey, you're about the same size. I I, I need you for something kind of weird. <laughs> but, you know, I need your, I, I need I your used, jaw. So I, yeah, I used uh, uh, another coworker's jaw. 
basically and added that to it. You know. Where did you learn that? I mean, that's such a specialized skill. Just, you know. You don't just. Lois, <laughs> Lois teaches. Well, Lois gives it. She, she has her own training. And so it, we all went through the training. Yeah. We, and some of us have been tr went through her week long course a couple of times. Yeah. And and part of that is skull reconstruction. And so we'll have a, uh, a picture of a skull. And so we're adding, like Brian said, layers to the mm -hmm. face. Your eyeball is about the size of a quarter. So you know where the eye, right. your eyes are going to be. There's uh, notches on your nose where your nose used to be. They'll let you know where your the skin belongs, where, you, where your nose curves at. So there's details. Your lip line is right, like or your teeth are right under your lip line so you know where the teeth are on on the uh on the skull so there's landmarks on the skull that let you know hey this is where his lips are this is where his eyes belong this now we're in the middle there's actually one i worked on that is unreal i mean no, and no. just look uh, these are some from this one yeah that was i think so this was, is that you was, that was actually lois's sketch she and i worked on it together oh wow but, uh, incredible actually, i think i have yeah Fascinating to see here, like the nose spot on, the mouth, the yeah. jaw lines spot on. Yeah. And Lois, she was a uh, she went to dental school, so she yeah. she she wow. taught us some of her tricks from dental school and stuff. Especially dealing with teeth, she was fascinated with teeth. I mean, this is all fascinating for you know for those of us who doodle. I mean, this is incredible. So, yeah. so what's the outlook for sort of the forensic art community? Do you see there being an increasing demand, and, and also how much is technology is changing it? Because here you guys are sketching, and you said that's still kind of the 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 core of it. Yeah, I mean, there's always technology, but there's nothing like uh, the human ability to, human ability to sketch. Yeah. There's nothing like hands on ability to sketch. I have friends that are work with other law enforcement agencies that are forensic artists or who work for the federal government with forensic or who are forensic artists and they still use pencil and paper. Uh, I know they have um, I, iPad Pro Plus, they have um, different software programs that you can sketch with, but to me it's nothing like sketching with your hand. And I and I've, and I've been trained on 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 all those programs, but I still rather use use pencil and paper. Right. Awesome. Hey, yeah, we're running. It, it's it's art. It, it is. It, there's as an artist, we bring you know a soul to these people, or a face. You know, ra rather than using if you're using technology, say like there's one that's uses photorealistic. Um, yeah, it's a photo pieces that you do. Yeah, I guess it's Photoshop, but that would create like a image that is like photorealistic like it looks like a real person and actually actually i was thinking about it and i'm like that that's not as effective as a sketch because if the public sees that that looks like a person so if there's any kind of margin of error that you know that image that you put together using photos it's not going to look exactly like you know the criminal when plus, suspect, so. what we're trying to do with our, our forensic art is we're trying to get, we're not trying to do, we're trying to trigger somebody else's memory who might have seen the suspect. We're not trying to do exactly a photorealistic picture of the person, but we're trying to get as close as we can to like, all right, hey, I might have seen this guy, or I've seen this tattoo, or I've seen the scar on this guy's face that trigger me. Hey, we know this guy. He's my, he may have did a crime someplace else. He looks familiar. So we're actually trying to get enough from the victim's memory to come up with a sketch to trigger somebody else. So somebody else may say, hey, right. I, I recognize this guy. It may, it may look like it. I, I look, it looks like him, but I think it's this guy. So that's how we get tips. That's how uh, information gets brought into the investigator. That's how they get, you know, the uh, Crime Stoppers gets a call or somebody calls in, hey, I, I, I think it's this guy who committed this crime. And so, imagine a little bit of of abstractness to a hand sketched image almost helps people kind of mentally fill in and shape it right to who it was that they saw versus those photorealistic. I mean, there's something sort of 
dead and computerized about that, that's hard to to fill in the gaps. Kind of yeah. like a cartoon, a 2D cartoon is always alive in our heads, even though it was 2D in front of us. Yeah, right. Yeah. And awesome. then, like I said, some of that technology, they autom automatically corrects lines, like they have autocorrect and stuff. Yeah. And so, I, I, like I said, I've worked with some of the technology, some of my training and stuff that I've, I've done outside of uh, Texas. And so, like I said, it the technology sometimes like I said, it auto corrects. It does things sometimes you don't want it to do. But as an, like I said, technology is always improving. I'm sure they'll come up with some program that's, and I've seen them that like, well, that looks like a sketch on a computer, you know, and they have the technology now because you can do anything. Yeah. So especially those filters, you see those filters now, <laughs> they look like sketches. So, but like I said, I, I rather, like I said, some of me and my, some of my friends work for the federal government, whether you use a pencil and paper. Well, it's amazing yeah, what you guys do. Uh, one last question before we go. I, I could talk to you guys all night and, and maybe we'll bring you guys back into our morning show once to have okay. you guys on. Uh, but we have one more question. What is the most difficult to sketch? Male, female, adult, youth, race? You you mentioned tattoos being one of the trickiest elements, but, but what is the most difficult thing to sketch? Hmm. I don't know. I haven't had too much, like anything real difficult. Maybe it's just too good. It's just all easy. I say clothing, hoodies, hoodies, hats, and we were just talking about it going out to eat. Uh, dreads. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I was telling him at uh, one of the schools that I went to, a kid asked me, he says, What's the hardest hairstyle to draw? And I was like, eh, Dreadlocks, probably, just because it's it's so busy. Yeah. You know, and I love dreads. It's right. just they're difficult. It depends <clears throat> on the style they have it or, you know. There's a lot of dread, dreadlock sketching. Plus, you're drawing a lot of three dimensional tubes on someone's head. So yeah, so you got to think about yeah. it like an artist, three dimensional. And gets a little tired after a yeah. while. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a little monotonous. Yeah. Well, for those of the, those who may watch this who are not in the Houston area, your department doesn't just work with Houston Police Department, right? I mean, you guys are available to help cases all over the region, all over the country if someone needs it, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. How do they get in touch with you? Oh. Uh, Usually call. Yeah, we usually just get phone calls. <laughs> yeah, our uh, our they call it the the Houston Police Department and ask for uh, victim services, and then they can that will connect them with us through victim services. And connected and, to a lot of great resources. Victim services is tremendous at the Houston Police Department. Yeah, yeah. Guys, we're out of time. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. It's been fascinating. I hope some artists find this and can learn a little bit and maybe be the next. Maybe you'll be the Lois Gibson to them. Exactly. Um, but, but I mean, I mean, she's she's still around. So those of you who oh, want yeah. oh, to yeah. learn from the best, she is available, as you see on her website. She still has her classes. You can go ahead and book one if you want. Uh, and guys, thank you so much. Everyone who tuned in, thank you guys so much. Um, and I appreciate you guys being part of the broader process of what we're looking at is finding missing people, age progressions being part of what you do. Um, as you saw here, Joanne is on here and Joanne mentioned that she received her age progression uh, from for Allie, met you guys at Houston Missing Persons Day. Um, so thank you guys so much for helping these families and for helping so many Houstonians solve crimes and helping all of us keep our streets safer by helping us to identify people who need to be um, dealt with. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and make sure you join us every Wednesday here at seven live on our live stream for the missing live. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.